Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and I wanted to to, to focus in on um, these the the Hinman emails because I think a lot of the perception out there is that maybe the Hinman emails will be you know good for just giving a bad perception of the SEC. But I think there's I think there's more to it than that. And then I'm going to go back and show you kind of some of the stuff around this thing that makes this really look bad. And, but I think that it's legally the more I see I'm thinking that legally this is going to help ripple to win this thing so so you'll remember when when the when Brad Garlinghouse and ripple finally got their hands on those Hinman emails he said that he, it would shock you he said the SEC wants you to think that it cares about disclosure transparency and clarity don't believe them when the truth eventually comes out the shamefulness of their behavior will shock you but he was retweeting what Stuart Alderati said as his response to seeing those emails. And he said, over the over 18 months and six quarters later, we finally have the Hinman docs, internal SEC emails and drafts of the infamous 2018 speech. While they remain confidential for now at the SEC's insistence, I can say that it is well worth the fight to get them. Here's the interesting part. He says, I've always felt good about our legal arguments and I feel even better now. So he's saying that there's something legally in in those about that, that would affect things legally in that in those emails. In other words, affect the case. I always felt bad about the SEC's tactics and I feel even worse about them now. So I think this is bigger, and and then of course we had Brad Garlinghouse when he said this recently. Now, in, in terms of where things stand today, I'm not going to try to thing, not get too much into the, the legal. Anyway, he 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 talks about how he thinks this is over in weeks, and then he goes right right to talking about the Hinman emails, which made makes me think that they're a significant part of what his thought process is. Then yesterday I showed you this one. Um, we do Hall. know that the judge issued an order um, very recently that. Uh, that, that pertain to you know which documents in the case would be kept under seal and which ones would not. Um, very importantly, at least in our view, uh, Bill Hinman's email. So there's just this focus every time somebody asks him about, about the cases. The, there's a focus on these emails, and with Stuart Alderati's comment, it just makes me think. So I want to show you. I'm gonna since we we all were involved in in uncovering Ethgate. Many of you were there. Many of you weren't. But I think it's important that we get out to thousands of people as we run up to the release of these just how bad it was and the things we found. First thing we found was Charles Gasparino, who, who apparently met with somebody from, the, from Consensus, the Brooklyn Project, or talked to them as a source, and they told him this in May of 2018, the month before the Bill Hinman speech. NASDAQ, and it's created by two, I would say, industry leaders, a guy named Joe Lubin, Andrew Keyes. They they're part of something known as Ethereum and Consensus. These are big cryptocurrency blockchain companies. They are working on this through this thing known as the Brooklyn Project. They have a lot of sources and friends on Wall Street. This, to me, will be the way that cryptocurrency and blockchain and the technology gets it's gets beyond the sewage rationale they are going to lead the effort to essentially systematize and rationalize and create a consumer protection organization through brought with blockchain and cryptocurrency and get and this is the key thing because they are working from what i understand with the sec the cftc on this a self-regulatory organization which will but what they what he didn't realize at the time is what they were really trying to do is just get a monopoly for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and I said here, what what happened to right? This is right after, folks, right after the Hinman speech. Joseph Lubin. Now remember, consensus was Joseph Lubin, but consensus has also started the Brooklyn Project. Now watch this. This is Joseph Lubin. 
and uh, token foundry and token lock services where uh, we can either issue a, an investor token or one of those consumer utility tokens that uh, Bill Hinman of the SEC said uh, wouldn't be deemed securities if, um, if you structured the token properly and if you marketed it properly. So you, you don't market it in huge quantities to, to uh, speculators. Yep. So, and, and many people forget, but Joseph Lubin was, was literally, he had a token factory. He shut it down, I think, somewhere during the process of up, us uncovering ETHGATE. So I said, what happened to Lubin's token fa factory? He said Hinman's speech is what allowed him to do it. Then Cowboy Crypto puts this out. This is from, this is 11 days after the Bill Hinman June 14th speech. 2018 uh, free pass speech on 6 18 token foundry says in light of the sec's recent comments and and leveraging the work of the brooklyn project token foundry has formulated an initial set of standards for selling consumer tokens and then he's retweeting this where he says remember when token foundry acknowledged publicly that in conjunction with the brooklyn project they together formulated an initial set of standards for selling consumer tokens Bill Hinman was the Brooklyn Project's in-house lawyer, or one of them, in-house attorney, right there. It even had his Gmail address, as I recall. Mr. Huber had said, after some digging into the Brooklyn Project, I found a list of these lawyers that can be reached via their private email address, and Bill Hinman was one of them. All right, so let me um, go back there. Okay. So then we have this, because you can't forget Andries and Horwitz's part in all of this. 2013, the Ethereum founders in the, there were in the offices of Andries and Horwitz. 2014, Andries and Horwitz attends the Bitcoin Miami conference. That's where they announced the fundraiser. I mean, it's in the video. I'll show it to you in a second. 2014, the e Ethereum ICO occurs. Whales are disguised. 2018, Jay Clayton meets with Andries and Horwitz. They, that's when he met and appointed Chris Dixon there to create the Venture Capital Working Group. Put that in motion. 2018, Hinman gives the Ethereum free pass speech. 2021, Hinman joins A16Z. Watch this. This guy right here that's talking is, I don't even know how to say his name, but he's, he was an Andrews and Horowitz general partner. Don't know if he is now. Let me get this going. You know, I remember Vitalik uh, when, uh, you know, most people don't know this, but you and uh, a group that became Blockstream and another group that became Colored Coins all came into um, A16Z in 2013 when me and Dixon were general partners there, right? And, uh, you know, I remember asking, you know, who's the founder? And everybody raised their hands at the same time. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, that's, that's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be some fission events here. There's gonna be some splitting and we're joining in, which is, which is what happens in recombination. And then at the uh, Bitcoin conference in, I think, 2014, um, you know, we, we all had that conversation out on, uh, it was a patio or a lunch thing. And the number- All right, so the, it's important to note Andrews and Horowitz was there when they announced the fundraiser. Do you think Andrews and Horowitz got some of, what, do you think it's possible that they were one of those disguised whales? Oh, I think it's more than possible. Co-founders had now dropped to like seven or something like that. So it's like a smaller number, but still, still in. Okay, so I'll talk a bit about the, about the funding model. So we will have a fundraiser for two months starting, Febu starting February 1st. It will be available at funds.ethereum.org. So, so the idea is that part of the initial issuance will be one 1,000 Ether for one Bitcoin or up to 2,000 Ether for one Bitcoin if you get in early to compensate for the increased risk. A person can, can buy uh, some Ether and then Then, after talking to Grunfest in a fireside chat at Stanford um, campus, uh, it's important to note that's Lowell Ness. He's Andrees and Horowitz crypto attorney. He's their guy. Made his way over to see Andrees in the next morning, and this is the part that now not a lot of people know. Um, and he invited um, Chris Dixon to round up the 
sort of the, the industry um, players. Uh, Andreessen, I've been representing Andreessen and all of their crypto um, investments since the, since the beginning. And so, um, so I got the chance to be the one to, to write all that stuff. So. And that's where they hired Bill Hinman. So then there's this, okay? And, and we keep asking, why did Hinman give the speech? This is Nancy Wotas. She was one of the attorneys. She's an attorney for Cooley. I think she's one of the good guys in this whole situation. She's a truth teller. Uh, here, she's, she's describing how after all, all of it happened, after she was in the meetings with all these attorneys in the Venture Capital Working Group, but I, I believe she was there in good faith thinking that they were actually trying to put together regulations for the entire industry. And I, I don't think she knew that what they were really trying to do is, is, is get Bitcoin and Ethereum out from under securities regulations and, and get a monopoly and then slam the door on the rest. Here, she's kind of surprised. And she's talking about how, how um, she's now, after that all happened and after the Bill Hinman speech, she's talking to the SEC and they're saying, well, we don't really believe any of that that was in the Hinman speech. If you have a fully functional network and you go ahead and you issue a token in that context, those early tokens will always be security tokens. And again, notwithstanding what the speech said. And we're going, well, tokens are mutable. You know, they can change. And that's what Bill Hinman said. And it's like, well, we don't really believe that. So, uh, so they don't really believe what the, that that's true, the, what Hinman's speech said, that you can, be, you can be a security and then become a non-security. So why did he give the speech? That's the question. Then here she is again. And listen to what she says here. Two disclaimers. I'm a former SEC staffer. And this is after the Bill Hinman speech, too. I love the SEC. They're just the wrong agency to be regulating this industry, in my view. And secondly, I'm not an anarchist. I actually believe in regulation. And I happen to believe in kind of a soft touch in this industry. So is the SEC doing enough? Well, utilizing the bully pulpit, they obviously have expressed very strong views that all cryptocurrencies equal securities, and therefore they have absolute jurisdiction over the 2,100 tokens out there trading uh, other than Bitcoin, and that fluctuates from day to day whether or not they consider Bitcoin a security or not, uh, and ETH, and, and again, that fluctuates. And that directive only came out of the head of the Division of Corporation Finance saying in a speech that neither of those were securities. So are they doing enough? In my view, no. Uh, they are viewing everything with hindsight. They were aware of the, the ICO uh, craze in 2017. Companies were in fact utilizing the Howey analysis, trying to figure out, gee, is this a security or not? And now in late 2018 and 2019, the SEC, with the benefit of hindsight, is saying, we disagree with your analysis. Right. So why did he give the speech? And then this is her at the Texas Bitcoin conference. This is after the Hinman speech too. This is a, an attorney from Perkins Coie, and this is another attorney, I think. Listen to this. What's interesting is I don't think Ether is decentralized. I think it's fully functional, but I don't think it's decentralized. But the chair, you know, the division director said it's decentralized. So, hey, look at the metrics for Ether. And, hey, you do a little better than that. Hey. Then why is it Ripple? Yeah, and I wonder if they, had, if they would have said that three years back. I mean, now they came back and said Ether is not, you know, it's not a security. But, you know, it's now. How about three years back? Would they have the same oh, There's no question. Ether, or Ethereum violated the law in the SEC's view when it issued its tokens. Uh, he said that in the speech, even though like consensus says, oh, no, 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 that's not what he said. That's what he said. He said, but then he said, look, the securities law is really, it doesn't add anything now because uh, Ether is decentralized. Again, no. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, 
<laughs> it's a long process. He gave the speech to intentionally introduce this vagary into the equation, meanwhile knowing that Bitcoin and Ethereum would in essence have their own regulatory monopoly. Make the, make the entire industry gray so that you reserve your right to sue everybody except projects around Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then once we exposed ETHGATE, they couldn't do it anymore. And that's why they're probably going after the whole industry now. Now this I called the United States is F. That's a Brad Garlinghouse quote. Watch this because this is where you start to see this video kind of features Bill Hinman and you, you can, you can read the 2014 Bill Hinman, Jay Clayton, take Alibaba public 2016 sec investigation into Alibaba 2017 Hinman and Clayton lead the sec 2017 us denies Alibaba deal to buy money. Graham 2018 Hinman ETH free pass speech. 2019, Ripple announces partnership with MoneyGram. 2019, Hinman launches SEC investigation into Ripple. 2020, Clayton files lawsuit against Ripple. Clayton and Hinman leave the SEC. Okay, watch this. We're ready to launch uh, the road show on Monday. So let's, uh, let's kick off. This is the schedule again. We're, we're at Hong Kong, right, right Joe? So we're asking people to come to break their holiday into two. Then we end up in London and then we fly back to the same. So you go, Jack, Justin. You go for its IPO? Could be the biggest IPO ever. We'll see what kind of market cap it generates. Opens a 92.7. The digital payments arm of Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba has offered to buy the U.S.-based MoneyGram for 880 million U.S. dollars. MoneyGram has agreed, but the deal needs regulatory approval from the U.S. Committee on Foreign Investment. MoneyGram is the second largest provider of money transfer service in the world. Ant Financial has more than 630 million users. The CEO of Ant Financial says if the merger succeeds, it will bring people around the world greater access, security, and simplicity to remit funds. The first high-profile Chinese deal blocked under Donald Trump. On Tuesday, a U.S. panel rejected the $1.2 billion sale of money transfer company MoneyGram to Ant Financial, owned by top execs of Chinese tech titan Alibaba. By the way, J.P. Morgan is an Ant Financial partner. The panel cited worries over national security on data that may be used to identify U.S. citizens. The deal's collapse is a blow for Alibaba head Jack Ma, who aimed to expand Ant's reach abroad as competition gets fierce over payment services in China. MoneyGram owns about 5% of the global remittance market. How will this deal work? Emily, it's great to be back. Thank you. Uh, the deal is a big step, I think, for Ripple, but it's even a bigger step for the overall industry. As you know well, there's been a lot of excitement around what blockchain and what digital assets and crypto can mean for the industry. And I think it's the reason why players like Facebook are diving in also. But we haven't yet seen much beyond experimentation. And it really at Ripple, I think we are the market leader because we have matured aggressively and we're really solving real problems for real customers. MoneyGram is just the manifestation of that. It is the second largest global remittance company. We're able to have a big impact with one customer and one partner in this. Introduced myself earlier. I'm a kid from Kansas who, you know, wears red, white, and blue on the Fourth of July. The United States, uh, you know, look, I, I, I'm sure this is probably being streamed and recorded, but I, I'll, I'll say, do something I rarely do. Disclaimer, disclaimer. I, I'll rarely, I rarely do this when I'm being recorded. The United States is fucked. <laughs> okay, um, let me get to a couple of things I want to show you. John Deaton is now a contributing writer. He contributed this article to Blockworks. 
Um, from Ripple and XRP to Filecoin, the SEC is simply illogical. Filecoin um, made a, uh, let me see here, not that one. Filecoin basically um, was in essence called a security, I think. When Grayscale tried to uh, file for a Filecoin trust, maybe, I think that's what the article is about. But John's making the point in here, he's been saying it all along. They're coming for all of them, okay? Now, Pathways to Regulation of Crypto Assets, a Global Re Approach. This was put out this month, World Economic Forum, and look what Cal the official cowboy of the Digital Asset Investor Channel found. Contributors and reviewers, Hugh Harsono, Manager Central Bank Digital Currencies from Ripple. And I'm gonna finish with this, and sorry this video, you know what, I'm not gonna play this video but basically, it's talking about XRP, FedNow, MNC Company, G30, Banking Circle, EuroX, and Bank. It's a pretty interesting video. Go watch it from Cyprus de Manansor. I don't know. I'll give them a follow. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family that Hinman, MoneyGram, Alibaba, SEC, JP Morgan, Nancy Wotas, it's a whole big drama, Andrews and Horowitz, it's one big mess that has been created, and I hope that it helps Ripple to win this lawsuit because we all deserve it and they deserve it.